one of the things that you're addressing, which I've discovered to be a core tenant, is this inventory that one can do around control and what one cannot control. You know, the Stoic asks, how can I flourish even when systems are breaking down around me? I can make myself a kind of citadel of reason. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. So I'll just start with, you know, can you give us some basic kind of definitional girding or, or background in Stoicism? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Stoicism was a philosophy that emerged in Athens in around 300 BC. The word comes from the Stoa Poikile, which was a painted colonnade, I think, in the Agora, in the marketplace in Athens. Um, pillars in a row underneath which the Stoics could be found, teaching and talking and debating for free, and anyone could come and listen. They talked to men and women, free, free men and slaves. Anyone could come and listen to the Stoics. And they said that if you followed their philosophy as a way of life, it would uh, bring you virtue and also serenity. It would make you invulnerable to fortune and therefore in some way like invincible, almost like a, like a god. Um, so this was a uh, religious philosophy, a spiritual philosophy. And they claimed uh, Socrates as their kind of uh, founding father. Socrates who first taught that uh, about a hundred years before, that virtue was sufficient for happiness, that all you needed to be happy was to have a virtuous soul. And this, the Stoics taught, was the kind of key to becoming invincible and invulnerable to fortune, not relying on externals because they're always transient, but instead looking within and building inner virtue. Hmm. Interesting. So place this in some chronological time for us. Sure. So you've got the first philosophers appearing, uh, the first people who call themselves philosophers in the 6th century BC around Greece in different bits of it. Pythagoras was the first person to use the word philosopher, which means lover of wisdom. Um, the first, the pre-Socratics, they were called, they speculated about the nature of the universe. They were looking for rational, naturalistic explanations of, um, of nature, particularly. Then uh, in the middle of the 5th century BC, you have this great Athenian enlightenment, this uh, efflorescence, uh, to use that word, of, of, of uh, rational thinking. Um, it, all in Athens, you get Hippocrates, the father of rational medicine, Thucydides, the father of rational history. Um, you get uh, Herodotus, the father of, uh, of rational anthropology. And uh, you get amazing artists, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Pindar, the poet, amazing breakthroughs in, 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 in statues, in architecture. And at the heart of this extraordinary flowering, this, you could say Renaissance, but it wasn't a Renaissance because it was the first time, <laughs> right. but this great explosion of genius, you have this figure, Socrates, um, who wanders around Athens. He's kind of poor, he's dressed shabbily, he's ugly with a pot belly, but he teaches, um, he says, all you Athenians, you only care about power and status and money. I want to teach you how to take care of your soul, which we now translate as psychotherapy, the care of the soul. He said, you can use your reason to examine your unconscious and automatic beliefs. See if they make sense or not. Hold them up to the light and think, is this true? Is this wise? And through that, through the examined life, you can attain eudaimonia, which was the Greek word for flourishing. Um, he's then put to death <laughs> for, his, <laughs> for his pains. <laughs> the Athenians yeah. don't like that. Uh, they put him on trial for corrupting the youth of Athens. You know, was this in reaction because this scene of the hemlock is, is so famous um, philosophically and obviously alters the course of Plato's life? But was there, was he a cr contrarian to any particular mainstream thought or philosophy? I mean, why was this so heretic? <clears throat> so a friend of his went to the Oracle at Delphi and said, who is the wisest man alive? And the Oracle, who is this lady who went into trances in a cave and channeled the god Apollo, 
said, uh, the wisest man alive is Socrates. Socrates was amazed when he heard this. Mm -hmm. So he said, this can't be true. So he went around interviewing people in Athens, anyone who had a reputation for expertise or wisdom to see surely they know what wisdom is. Surely they know what truth and justice is. And he'd um, you know, interrogate them and discover that they were actually completely ignorant. So you can imagine that didn't make him any friends, just exposing people to ridicule, famous Athenians. <laughs> and he said, well, if I'm the wisest man alive, it's because at least I know how little I know. So I think that did not endear him to people. Um, there may have been political reasons as well. He had some friends who tried to overthrow democracy. Socrates himself didn't. But, um, and he was encouraging young people to think for themselves. Mm. This is a dangerous idea. Do not just accept um, the tribal superstitions. Do not just accept the taboos of your society. Don't just follow what your parents tell you or your culture. Um, so that, I think, probably pissed people off as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting how we, how humanity perceived the political life at that time in history, or now mm. we have a very uh, sullied notion of what is politics. We think about it as electoral politics or what happens mm. in Washington or whatever. But at this time, there was uh, you, you talk about the public square, you talk about public life, mm. that a central part of one's life was this kind of free exchange of ideas that was happening uh, in public yeah. uh, on the around the painted porch or whatever. I've heard of uh, these different things. And, um, and so much of it um, was based around this notion of the Socratic dialogue and questions, right? And, um, and so the, how did the Stoic then tradition grow out of the Socratic time? Well, there was an important shift for Socrates and his generation, for his student Plato, for Plato's student Aristotle. The good life is inseparable from the good society. You can't really think about your individual flourishing separate from the flourishing of your society. So for Aristotle, for example, an essential part of the good life is being a free democratic citizen. What happens then in the third century BC is a lot of these Greek city-states get conquered by, by various invading empires, the Macedonians and then the Roman Empire. Um, and there's a breakdown of um, the city-states. So philosophers start to ask themselves, how can we live the good life when systems are breaking down around us? Mm. And what you get in the third century BC, in this era that's known as Hellenistic philosophy, um, is various attempts to answer that. How to live a flourishing life kind of on your own when you can't even depend on, on the secure liberal democracy around you. Stoicism is born out of that. So is Epicureanism and so is skepticism. These are all almost more therapeutic philosophies. Um, they do not on the whole uh, prescribe grand political schemes for society like Plato and Aristotle did. These are philosophies for the individual to follow. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, the Stoic asks, how can I flourish even when systems are breaking down around me? I can make myself and my soul a kind of citadel of reason. So even if everything's breaking down around me, I can still do the good life. So this is why it inspires in the 20th century, someone like Viktor Frankl, how can I live a flourishing life even in a concentration camp? The Stoics, by the way, were often getting exiled and, uh, and put to death as well. So famous Roman Stoics, were, you know, Epictetus, a famous Roman Stoic, was exiled twice. Seneca was exiled and put to death. So they're also, also asking, how can I lead a good life even in captivity right. or under tyranny? Right, yeah, Seneca, who was quite wealthy, um, for much of his life, even then, I, I know he was exiled. I think to Corsica at some point in his life, and then came back as a as a consul to to Nero, and um, but all, but lived a fairly highfalutin life. Apparently, one of the richest um, men of his time. And yeah. in fact, one of his techniques was actually to embrace poverty 
as a as a stoic em, uh, embracing of um, uh, of adversity, uh, which yeah. I, was just interesting. And then, of course, Epictetus, who was, I, I believe, a slave most of his life. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because we associate reason and rationality so much with the Enlightenment age, but yeah. of course, you know, we have the roots of it back in Hellenistic times. Um, and I think one of the one of the things that you're addressing, which I've discovered to be a core tenet of of Stoicism and my little knowledge of it, is this inventory that one can do around control and what one cannot control. And mm-hmm. I think you address that a little bit when you're talking about this individualist philosophy that might be um, that might in some ways exist within a walled garden separate from the flourishing of the state or the decimation of the state that this is because that might be something out of one's control so can you unpack that a little bit this sort of notion of control versus Mm. because the stoics were active politically marcus aurelius was the emperor of rome Rome. (laughs) seneca was the leading advisor to nero But um, they practiced a technique of constantly reminding themselves what's in our control and what's not. Um, Epictetus teaches it. If you read his discourses, he's constantly talking about focus on what's in your control, accept what's not in your control. Um, One way I teach it is that um, to think of it as as two spheres, kind of one circle inside another. The smaller circle is zone one, the, the outer circle is zone two. Zone two are the things in life that according to Epictetus, we don't have complete control over. And that's pretty much everything external, other people, um, politics, the climate, um, our own body, uh, our reputations. All of these we have some control over, but to some extent they are beyond our complete control. Uh, We're all getting older, we can all get sick, we're all gonna die. Um, Other people are not gonna do exactly what we want them to do and so on. Um, In zone one is the things in life, according to Epictetus, that we do have control over if we choose to exercise it. The only thing in zone one is our own beliefs, not even our own actions, because we could be locked up in a jail cell. Um, He says that human suffering uh, comes from two mistakes. First of all, we try to exert complete control over something in zone two. We say it must be a certain way. And if it isn't, it's a complete catastrophe. So we might make our self-esteem and our happiness and our whole identity conditional on something in zone two. I am uh, only an acceptable person if I am uh, rich, if I'm in the, you know, the, the, the top hundred uh, billionaires, if uh, my, my wife uh, loves me unconditionally and always uh, behaves exactly like, like I want, if I'm uh, always good looking and so on. We forget, we make a category error. We forget that zone two is beyond our control. And everything in zone two is in the realm of fortune. Fortune uh, for the Greeks, like in the Middle Ages, was a blind goddess. Uh, Boethius, another philosopher, talked about the wheel of fortune. It's this idea that it's always changing. Uh, As Heraclitus put it, everything flows. As the Buddha put it, you know, everything is constantly changing. So if you tie your self-esteem to something in zone two, you might be happy for a bit, but then the wheel of fortune will change and you're going to be, you're going to feel helpless, frustrated, bereft, uh, and a slave of fortune. So that's one mistake. We, we, we forget that we're not gods. We can't uh, control zone two, like Caligula, who declared war on the sea and got his soldiers to go and whip the sea. He forgot he wasn't a god. He literally thought he was a god. Um, The second mistake we make is that we don't take responsibility for zone one. We don't uh, take control over our own beliefs. Instead, we use um, external events as an alibi. We say, I had no choice. I couldn't help but completely lose my temper. I couldn't help but hit you. I couldn't help but, uh, you know you uh, drink a bottle of vodka again because of because of my day because of like, so we basically use the external as an alibi and epictetus is quite a kind of tough love teacher he says the robber of your free will does not exist in modern therapeutic terms you could say what happened to you is not necessarily your fault but how you respond to it is your responsibility 
So there's a constant focus on, on zone one. Um, build your character on zone one, on your own kind of beliefs, your own uh, virtues. And that gives you a kind of freedom because, you know, whatever happens tomorrow or next year, you can meet it with the resources of zone one. And in fact, the Stoic says, you know, Seneca says, the Stoic treats all adversity as training. Mm -hmm. So something could happen to you in zone two that is in conventional terms, bad, like you lose your job or um, you get ill. But in terms of um, training your inner moral self, it could be like the, the most grueling, but ultimately uh, growing workout. So Epictetus says, um, uh, you know, treat difficulties like a sparring partner that Zeus has sent you to train with. Um, you know, difficulties reveal men's character, he says. So there's a kind of flip. You try not to, I mean, we can talk about, they, they talk about being careful how you label events to avoid just, you know, conventional labeling. Oh, this is an awful, this is a catastrophe. This is unbearable. And yeah, or, or even the notion of failure itself as a, as um, as adversity in one's life, that it yeah. isn't failure if you're actually taking it and learning and iterating such that you don't repeat it. And um, it really, I, I think, informs in many ways the Stoic idea of or understanding of wisdom. Um, where wisdom can often um, be an admission or an acknowledgement of your own failures. Um, and there's, you know, of course, the the aphorism. And one thing I love about Stoicism is that it's full of maxims and aphorisms. Mm. But, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, w w wisdom really... It, I would say experience begets wisdom if one is able to acknowledge one's mistake and constantly shift uh, such that the next time it's different. Yeah. And um, it seems like that the Stoics embraced failure as a consistently as an opportunity to learn. And baked in there, you must have a lot of humility. So humility also seems to be a, a central part of what wisdom is to the Stoics. Um, there's also, I think, you know, quite a bit written about um, insults, for example. Um, the Stoic is generally one to brush off an insult. And I think that that often informs this modern definition of the word, of the word Stoic, which is someone that seems to be, you know, unemotional about... Uh, you know, negative things that might happen. So which is uh, clearly gives sort of stoicism sort of this dispassionate, kind of a bad name in a way mm. that sort of belies really what stoicism really is. Mm. Um, but it, it um, you know, we were talking a little bit before about the ability to absorb insult, for example, and how that might, um, how that might impact, um, things around like hate speech or free speech or censorship that in some ways um, when, an, when a, a state comes in and basically bans some kinds of free speech, it actually empowers it where a stoic might say, no, I'd rather build my psychological immune system through receiving an, an insult and brushing it off the same way sort of uh, a biological immune system has to have some sort of um, vulnerability to bacteria and, and, and virus to, to actually mm. build itself up. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting, you know, part of when I think about stoicism and its modern applicability to society, mm. sometimes I ask this question, like, what would a stoic do? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, censorship, for example, or free speech is such a central point of debate in our culture right now. I, I guess I would ask you, what would a stoic do around um, um, around an issue like hate speech? Um, 
I think a really key quote to understand Stoicism and the wisdom of Stoicism, and one that hugely helped me, I mean, the reason I got into it was it kind of helped me with, I had bad social anxiety in my early 20s, and it really kind of helped me through that. And um, it's a quote um, by Epictetus again, who says, um, people are not disturbed by events, but by their opinion about events. So um, it's not what happens to you, it's how you think about it. It's how you interpret it, how you talk about it in your mind. Um, that quote, by the way, inspired cognitive behavioral therapy. So it was invented by an American psychologist, Albert Ellis, inspired by Epictetus. Like I interviewed him, I interviewed Aaron Beck, the other great pioneer of CBT. Both of them told me they were inspired by Epictetus. So that's a, that's a trip yeah. that uh, philosophy <laughs> from 300 BC is the main inspiration for the kind of leading therapy of our time. So any kind of thing that happens to you, it's how you think about it. If someone insults you, a Stoic would say, there's two possibilities. Um, they're right, and then they've given you a gift because they've pointed out, it might sting, but they've told you about a, a, you know, a, a failing of yours. Um, or, or, or they're wrong, in which case you don't have to really pay attention to it. Or they're talking about something that you know, is indifferent anyway. You know, if they're insulting your character, then you know, that's, that's important because you've got to think, are they right there? But if they're insulting your, you know, your, your looks or something like that, well, for a Stoic, that's kind of indifferent. Socrates would say, yeah, I'm the ugliest person in Athens, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's not really about that. It's about what's inside. So, um, yeah, they would, they, would, they would almost, I mean, I've done workshops and I, I, I don't advise this actually as a workshop technique where you <laughs> practice being insulted Yeah, because people were far too good at it and <laughs> they got really offended. So I tried that in a company and I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so, you know, the idea is that you are, um, you know, Marcus Aurelius says, don't, uh, depend on anyone else for your credit. Don't lean on anyone else's like uh, approval, like stand on, you know, stand on your own good deeds and, and, and your own inner virtues. Um, so other philosophers, uh, taught how to manage public opinion. Stoics um, were, were loftily indifferent mm -hmm. to approval or disapproval. Um, that probably meant they weren't always great politicians. There was a, an American famous vice admiral called James Stockdale, sure. who uh, ran for vice president, I think with Ross Perot, was it? Yeah, I met him one time, uh -huh. actually, yeah. It was an so, unbelievable story. So he, he memorized Epictetus's teachings and then was caught as a, um, captured as a prisoner of war, I think in the Korean War. Uh, or was it, it was the, or maybe the Vietnam one. I, I get confused with him and John McCain, but it, right. maybe it was the Vietnam one. And he was tortured and he, um, he used Epictetus to get through that and to see it as moral training and said he came out kind of uh, stronger. So an incredible man, an incredible uh, warrior, probably not a great politician. <laughs> he was, a, you know, he, he, he crashed in the debate because he came out and he said, who am I? Why am I here? And my mom was <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yeah, that was yeah, too ontological for the political stage. So he, uh, what I'm, my, my point is that Stoics, um, yeah, they, they were just, it was all about being uh, kind of invincible within. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it does, it does help me, for example, and it's not, I'm still a passionate person, but it helps me to modulate my passion when I'm when I I might fly off the handle. Not to auto, you know, it's trying to lessen automatic reaction. So Epictetus says, when an impression occurs to you, when a stimulus occurs to you, say to yourself, uh, stay a moment, impression. Let me test you. Let me discover what you are. So they're trying to train people not to have knee-jerk reactions. Yeah. Um, you know, this is in a lot of spiritual teachings, the fact that we are 99% automatic, just on autopilot, but it's to kind of create that space between the stimulus and the response, and that space for reflection. And, you know, that probably fails a lot of the time, but every now and then you might catch it. And it's also a training in, in equanimity, so it's not just, it's not caring. It's not about not caring, but it's about learning to roll with the, with the ups and downs. And, you know, sometimes that can, that can, that can work. I mean, you're, you're into your tennis, aren't you? Like, like me. And so it's, um, I use it to like 
train my self-talk during tennis. If I'm really getting down on myself, be aware of your automatic self-talk and kind of consciously reframe it like, well, look, I'm playing outside. This isn't so bad. This is quite a good situation. Um, and, and just to regulate your emotions. You know, psychologists talk about these key techniques that humans have for regulating emotions that makes us different to kind of um, other animals. Uh, and one of the key ones is called cognitive reappraisal. What this means is the cognitive appraisal is your first take on something. Oh, you know, did, did that person just, you know, uh, flick me the bird or whatever? How dare he? He deserves to be stomped. Cognitive reappraisal is the kind of retake. Just wait a second. Is that the right way to frame it? Is there a different way I could frame it? When you do that reappraisal, it changes your physiology. Your, your blood stops boiling. So this is, and, and, and psych psychologists of emotion look back to the Stoics for this technique. So they really taught us kind of emotions 101 in terms of how to regulate your emotions. Yeah. And again, this, this relies very much on a dispassionate rationality turned inwards in the examination of one's own mind to better understand phenomena that may be arising moment to moment. So particularly sensations and emotions. So I think I want to go back to something that you said or you touched on a moment ago, because I think it's really very central to what's happening right now, that, um, that people's reactions to a particular event um, that there is the event, and then of course there is the reaction. But as you referenced, Frankel, the space in between, can we find that in, there in which lies our growth? Um, more, most of the time, or more often than not, our sensations or the emotions that arise in reaction to a particular event have to do with our judgment or our belief about the particular event other than um, instead of the actual content of the event itself. You know, so we have, for example, you know, right now in, in, in the United States, we still have, you know, a, a very severe uh, political divide where, you know, there's still 78% of Republicans, for example, that believe that our last presidential election was stolen. So, you know, there may be an event that says, you know, Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election. But because people have so much emotion around uh, or, or so much judgment around Joe Biden or Democrat or Republican or around politics that we skip over any rigorous examination of the event itself and immediately jump to this place of like indignation and exasperation and anger and outrage and the, it was stolen it must have been stolen you know and without any real commitment or regard to examining evidence or trying to remove bias and actually rigorously examine whether or not that sensation is justified or not. And what I, I think that, you know, social media obviously fans um, the, the flame of, of constant outrage and constant, what I call often, often call amygdala hijack. So the Stoics are, are operating very much in the prefrontal cortex. You know, they're leveraging reason and rationality to rigorously examine the nature of the event itself. However, if you're being guided just by your judgment of a particular event, you may easily go to the part of your brain, the amygdala, the fear center of your brain that's, you know, excreting through the, via the hypothalamus, um, uh, cortisol and epinephrine through your body. And you have this, you know, reaction that becomes hyper emotional and it seems as if, and, and obviously that was designed um, for the Serengeti, <laughs> and then yeah. it, it had great utility for us as hunter-gatherers, mm. but we're constantly as humans now being tweaked 
as if we were on the Serengeti by major news media or by influencers or by Facebook or some other algorithmic driven kind of uh, social media platform to leverage this negativity bias such that we skip this the space the uh, re the reappraisal or the reappraisal the yeah. reappraisal mm. and uh and i think it's it's very dangerous because what we're seeing is binary opposition on almost every salient prescient issue that that comes to the fore whether that's vaccines or gun control or abortion or who won the election or you know on and on what we're seeing is people that have that have their opinions are so girded to their emotions that there seems like this idea of socratic public discourse has completely evaporated and we cannot find a way to engage in thoughtful conversation such that someone might change their mind given particular kind of evidence so what we're functioning on as is almost faith which is belief in the lack of evidence and yeah and uh and and you know you and I are both very concerned around social cohesion and cooperation i think we both agree that many of the great human projects have been predicated around people finding that ability to work together and function at, at scale and when we have these kind of codified polar oppositions that are hyper emotional it is hard to find any of that coherent uh middle ground and mm -hmm. um so i i wonder you know what role if any you know and it can doesn't have to be just stoicism but stoicism or other spiritual or philosophical traditions can play in us being able to bridge some sort of gap such that we can find a, um some degree of social cohesion and i'll just end here because because in the absence of social cohesion what ends up happening is the dominant group mandates <laughs> forces something upon the minority group and that is not a profitable project mm. uh, across human history mm. so i wonder if you could comment on that okay well i do think that um stoic practices can help people to to become somewhat more um aware of their tendency to error uh and uh and a bit more can train ourselves in like the socratic method in critical thinking um so from a personal level i i think it it, it can ha it's helped me be somewhat less knee jerk in my thinking sometimes um i would say you know i i think christian teachings are very good on things like humility probably better than greek philosophy greek philosophy is a lot about pride <laughs> uh you know being godlike in your reason whilst christian wisdom uh is like i'm i'm messed up you know that's its starting point i'm screwed up you're screwed up and that's just how it is so there's more of an acceptance of imperfection than you sometimes find among modern stoics who is like hmm. well i don't think you're being rational well i'm you know and it's like yeah. yeah there's a lot of passive aggression underneath there because they're so rational on the surface so, right well i think we've talked about this before is that there's one side that puffs up its chest and, and with indignation points at the other side and, and accuses yeah. them of a lack of critical thinking yeah. while the other side is literally pointing back as if in a mirror the yeah. other direction with the yeah. same accusation exactly exactly <laughs> so it's possible that um you know that philosophy can can help us yeah, and practical philosophy can help us be somewhat less automatic sometimes and and, and other ways you know and, and i think Buddhism has uh, and kind of you know mindfulness of breath and mindfulness of body has helped me you know as i'm sure it's helped you know, thousands and millions of others to regulate my emotions or just be aware of what's going on in my body like oh i'm really furious you know like and i think 5 years ago i'd have been quite 
alienated from my emotions. So I wouldn't even realize, you know, until, oh, my, my fists are clenched. I must be really angry. So, so those, but these are, these are really practices for the individual. Right. And what you're asking me as well is how to, how to improve our social culture. Um, and, you know, Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of Rome and he said, you know, he was in a position, he could have rolled out a stoic program for his citizens. And he said, you, you know, words to the effect of you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. And all you'd get if you tried to legislate stoicism was kind of, as, in, as he put it, feigned assent. So like, oh yeah, sure, Marcus, we're stoics. So this is tricky. I mean, like, I, um, there was a, a guy in the 60s, I can't remember his name now, but he was appalled by the polarization of, of like 68 and so on, which was worse than now. Public figures constantly being assassinated, for example. And um, out of that, he launched, um, you know, things like he wanted to have philosophy in schools. He wanted to have philosophy cafes, places where you could reason um, with each other. So, um, you know, but this, it's, it's a bit of a drop in the ocean. Um, but... Um, you know, people thought that long form podcasting was, you know, you could <laughs> sit down and really, you know, just to have a, you know, it's all about good faith arguments and that kind of what happens now. Various long form podcasters are refusing to speak to each other, aren't they? Because <laughs> one is pro vaccine and one is pro ivermectin and so on. So the long form yeah. is in, in the sense making community. Everyone thought, oh, well, sense making, we can really have those difficult conversations. Now I see sense makers not talking to each other and falling out. Yeah. So, um, I think one of the issues is the erosion of spaces where we just bump bump into each other with people from different backgrounds. So this is like, you know, you, you might you remember the book Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam, mm -hmm. uh, the sociologist, and he talked about people used to bowl in leagues together. And now the membership of, of bowling leagues has declined and everyone, there's much more rise in people bowling alone. And he, he charts the decline of membership of civic associations in the, in the States across yeah. the board, the, the Rotary Club or the local choir or the book club and so on, or church, um, places you go where you just bump into people, neighbors, people who might have different opinions. They say back in the old days, you know, your neighbor might be a Democrat or a Republican, but you still go around for a barbecue. Yeah. Uh, you remember those days? You know, so, so we, um, all of these civic spaces have been hollowed out and we've got online instead. And in online, we are in our, uh, in, you know, our tribal bubbles uh, and we, we only hear about the other side, the most egregious examples of their idiocy which scouts go out and bring back to us. Oh, you guess what the Republicans did or guess what the Democrats did. So, yeah. um, so yeah, how yeah. do we build civic spaces where we, you know, and I, it's, it's, it's an interesting one for spirituality versus Christianity. We're, you know, we're both, I guess, more in the spiritual culture side of things, but churches, you go there and you meet people from different, uh, income levels and, and, uh, all kinds of different ethnicities and classes, Whilst I think spirituality sometimes is more like self-selecting groups, you know, so, um, yeah. How do yeah, you, how, I, you know? I read a depressing figure the other day where 40 years ago, 25% of Americans lived in a landslide district, basically a district where one party or another won in a landslide. And now we're up to 85% of Americans live in a landslide district. Yeah. So, so the union is being strained. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think that there is some, uh, glimmer of hope inside of story. Now the Stoics, for example, to bring it back there, they were very good at raising above and looking at things from 40,000 feet, right? Trying to see, you know, not getting lost, uh, and not seeing, being able to see the forest through the trees. And, you know, I think it's very easy, particularly on social media, which I consider this is basically private acts happening in public. Um, I think it's very easy on social media to focus in on one magnified component of a person's life or opinion. And we talked about, you know, the, this before, there are certain issues that seem so galvanizing that they manage to eclipse anything else that might matter in the world. So, for example, with the pro-life movement, um, 
despite the fact that they might also care about uh, you know, clean water or affordable housing or immigration reform or any uh, you know, multiplicity of issues that may impact their lives, they are single issue voters because that one particular issue manages to transcend all other things. Um, and you know, I've seen that also happen within uh, parts of you know, the wellness community and other parts around vaccines where people are so emotional about one particular issue that they're willing to basically, you know, overlook climate or, um, you know, child tax credits or all these other things that are happening um, in, in the Biden administration right now. So sometimes, you know, this kind of microscopic um, idea of who one is socially is self-imposed around you know issues that are particularly volatile that take on sort of a vitriolic nature online mm. but at the same time i think there is an opportunity to try to find common humanity and common ground in the forty thousand foot view of what it is like to be a human you know where you have a story that it has a millions of inputs that informs the experience of what it is like to be Jules. And I'll just share with you an experience that I had last summer. So I was writing a lot of essays, as you do as well. I was publishing them through our commune community, and I was tackling, you know, some thorny issues. I mean, how how could you not tackle uh, something? thorny in the year 2020 with mm. all with everything that happened and so i was you know from a through a spiritual lens poking at covid and the election and misinformation and the reckoning for social justice and all of these things and i was writing 2500 3000 words a week and if you're going to write that many words as you know you're bound to piss someone off with <laughs> two or three of those words um and so i would get a lot of um incoming E email and, and correspondence, some from the right and some from the left, honestly. And, and some of it, there was nothing to do with it be because it was, it was so triggered that there was no dialogue to be uh, fostered. But in many cases, people had very thoughtful ideas. Yeah. And um, so I, in those cases, I, in not in every case, but in select cases, um, I offered myself up for a Zoom call. So I spent a good chunk of time over the course of the summer of 2020 having Zoom calls with people that didn't agree with me about something. Mm -hmm. Good for you. <laughs> and, um, and I didn't have any training in nonviolent communication or any of these things necessarily, but you caught on quickly if you have even a modicum of social intelligence. Um, and there was a consilient experience across almost every one of these conversations, Jules, which is the Zoom would start, there would be some pleasantries, and then I would say nothing for 45 minutes. And the person on the other side was not even addressing the issue with which they took offense. They just told me their life story. Hmm. And these were, you know, conservatives from red states. These were people of all sorts of creeds and colors and so, and, so, and sexual orientations on the left. And, um, and I just sat there in receipt of these people's live stories. And, you know, after 45 minutes or an hour, you know, I would be taking notes and I would be saying, well, you know, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing with me. And guess what? I was born in Chicago too. And guess what? I drove across country too and my car broke down. And guess what? You know, I have a brother who's a musician and so do you. And we were finding areas of commonality, of shared humanity. And it just, the whole adversarial, pugilistic atmosphere of it just absolutely dissipated and we just saw each other as human beings and then eventually we might get around to actually talking about the issue that had sparked the the debate in the first place but more often than not you know these people became friends 
And now I have like all these, you know, we get sent text messages and then many of them are quite, you know, uh, you know, just fun and, and sarcastic and ironic and, you know, playful the way friends can be. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, but it really did require the investment of a tremendous amount of time. Mm. Um, but to realize really that just people just want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want to be dignified. And, uh, and I think that's a great challenge for humanity is how do we give that gift to each other at scale right now? Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's, it's an investment of time. Uh, and, and people don't want to give that, but I, I mean, I applaud you for doing that. And I think probably was it a, I mean, a worthwhile experience for you as well, like um, life changing for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's kind of a it's a hopeful story, you know, for 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 for, for this country. Yes, I would say there is no greater personal development tool, and I'm steeped in many of them, as you know. Yeah. Than calmly listening to someone that doesn't agree with you. Mm-hmm. I can, the closest, uh, it reminds me of two things. First of all, it reminds me of a philosopher, uh, American philosopher called Robert Talese. Mm. Talks about, he, uh, he's a pragmatist philosopher. How can we protect democracy? And he says, one of the issues at the moment is perhaps we're over-politicized. We used to kind of say, oh yeah, he, you know, he voted for Reagan, but we support right. the same baseball team yeah. or, uh, you know, our kids are in little league together or something. But now politics looms so large in our consciousness. And maybe that's because of, you know, Facebook or, or, or tech or whatever that we can't see past that. I mean, and I, I, you know, I, my housemate during the pandemic was a, you know, vaccine denier who, who, who was taught by her homeopath that if she resonated at a high enough frequency, she couldn't catch COVID. So I didn't like agree with that part of her, but everything <laughs> else, she was like, a very kind, lovely person. She was a great housemate during, uh, you know, she didn't, so, mir- miraculously, she didn't get COVID as well. So, <laughs> but so, you know, like I saw Brexit ruin friendships mm, um, yeah. in, in the UK and like, you know, like, yeah, I have friends who supported Brexit and I didn't really agree with them on that, but they had lots of other, you know, other lovely parts of them. So it's like being able to not just see people as just single issue individuals, but, but we're, 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 we're complex. And then in terms of, you know, that your, your great story, I mean, it reminded me last week, uh, a friend and a reader tweeted me saying, hi, Jules, I have a number of, um, I have some feedback about your writing. Uh, shall I just share them on Twitter or should we hop onto a call? And I was like, I was like, you know what every writer's like, I don't want your feedback. Just 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 give me like likes and claps, okay? I don't yeah. want you to. So I said, uh, can you put, you know, can you put it into a document and just email it to me? And I, I thought, you know, she and she said, um, yeah, I think you have a kind of bias against um women. Like you often write more about men when you do long profiles about spiritual teachers they always, they tend to be men when you're kind of particularly denigrating about toxic wellness she said to me you often kind of are particularly denigrating and and and, and about women like you know Gwyneth Paltrow or something like that so i think you've got a bit of a bias and of course that my instinct was you know into the rubbish <laughs> bin but then you know then i you know and then i thought actually if she's right that's really, really valuable feedback. Like, cause you know, like, you know, from someone who knows you well, he's going to say like, even though it stung and my first instinct was to kind of throw it away, I thought, well, let's look, or, you know, maybe I have written more about men than women. So maybe I could make the effort to kind of, uh, balance that out. So it was the, talk about cognitive reappraisal. My first instinct was like, where does this lady get off? Yeah. You know, like, uh, and then my second instinct was actually maybe she's given me a gift here, and this is this is actually really useful feedback. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a very similar um, story around a, a an article that I wrote that was called Interdependence Day, and it was published around Independence Day. No offense, yeah. um, in our country, uh, <laughs> July fourth. Yeah. And in it, I, you know, am really, I'm mostly talking about how we exist as mutually interdependent beings. Um, and we seem to have lost sight of that in a culture that sanctifies individualism on and on. Yeah. Um, that could be another topic that we, we probe. But, but I used language 
um, that referenced the founding fathers and how, in many ways, uh, their lofty goals and ideals were hypocritical in practice, um, and uh, and that it's been America's messy history to better align um, our human condition, you know, with our highest principles. But she took great offense at the at some of the language that I had leveraged. First of all, she was a woman of color, so she really just did not like the word Independence Day at all because she said, I didn't get any independence. Mm. You know, my my family, my ancestors didn't get any independence on Independence Day and mm. July 4th. Actually, it was July 5th, but mm. it goes down as July 4th, 1776. Um, and, uh, and what is this about founding fathers? Mm. You know, um, and at first I had a very similar reaction. I'm like, well, listening, I'm actually just trying to write an article talking about how we're all actually mutually interdependent and we're in interconnected and that we need to see ourselves as a greater community and there needs to be distributive justice and equity and all of these things. And um, so that was my first instinct was, you know, like the one that you had was like, wait a minute. Um, but then actually I reappraised. And and I realized that there are words that and terms that have an expiration date. And if those words and terms might not be offensive to me, but I can sit with it and see how they can be really offensive to somebody else. So, you know, I, I expired the notion of founding fathers from my writing vocabulary in, uh, in the wake of that. And I just use framers, you know, I think that's okay, you know, um, and it, you know, avoids that patriarchal, um, shadow mm. that's cast by that particular phrase. So, you know, it's not something I might always do, but I think that there's some cases where, you know, we can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that, I, I, I suppose I'm better at thinking in kind of one of my biases is I'm better in thinking of kind of individual solutions rather than systemic. Yeah. Cause I kind of feel like someone else has probably got that covered better than me, but I'm sure there are like systemic things that we could do to improve our public uh, debate. Like today, well, there's a Senate hearing on Facebook, isn't there? So there's a whole conversation around reforming big tech, mm -hmm. which I'm not an expert on that, but I think, I, 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 I don't think it's, by acts, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that our public conversation has degraded as social media has become much more of an, uh, you know, uh, uh, an influence. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw a Congress person recently holding up a meme during a kind of congressional hearing. <laughs> no. Did you, did you see this? Yeah, this is a post, post, post modern. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah. she's using a meme in a congressional it, hearing. This is like, well, you know, like the it, Facebookization of, of democracy. Right. In a non digital. Uh, it was, a, it, it was, yeah, yeah, it was a printout. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, full circle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, practices on an individual level because Stoicism and Buddhism and, and certainly other philosophies and religions, um, become more, I don't want to say become more real but become instantiated through ritual and through practice. And in many ways, the process is the product for, um, for many of these traditions. So yeah. I'm curious uh, around some of your practices that have really bent the arc of your, your spiritual yeah. life or perhaps led to a more happy, good life. Yeah, well, this is really what uh, really got me into stoicism and, and and cognitive behavioral therapy as well. It was when I read a, a, a writer called Pierre Addo. Have you ever read him? Have mm -hmm. you come across him? No. He's a French kind of classicist. Uh, and in about 1980, he wrote a book. Um, it's published in English as Philosophy as a Way of Life, 
It's a big influence on Michel Foucault, by the by, who got into kind of ancient Greek philosophy at the end of his life. And Hado, Pierre Hado, H-A-D-O-T, talked about how ancient philosophy wasn't just theories, it was spiritual exercises, daily practices. And he delineated and described some of these practices. Um, so you've got things like, I mean, a basic one is the Socratic method. Uh, you have your, you know, you're upset about something. You ask, you learn to ask yourself questions. First of all, what is the belief or opinion underlying this emotional reaction? Uh, I, you know, Jim hates me. Then you hold that opinion up to the light. Is that definitely true? Where's the evidence? Have you, have you sometimes misinterpreted that? Uh, if, if it is true, you know, is there a different way you could see that? What can you practically do about it? So that's one basic method. Learning to examine your automatic beliefs. It's a kind of archaeology, uncovering these unconscious uh, assumptions you drag around which completely frame your reality. So that's just the basic thing of asking yourself questions. The second practice is, um, is this in my control or is this uh, not? Zone one or zone two. Um, third practice they have is they're extremely good on um, habit formation. Um, they, um, the Stoics, like um, other philosophy schools, like the Epicureans and so on, were into maxims. They would try to make their philosophies easy to remember with little sayings like uh, Marcus Aurelius says, life itself is but what you deem it, or all adversity is training from Seneca, or the robber of your free will does not exist from Epictetus, and so on. Um, they wanted to make it easy to memorize. So the path of philosophy is partly about training your memory. And the trainee uh, Stoic would uh, repeat these maxims. They would carry them around in little handbooks, which were called Enchiridions. Um, they might um, you know, say them th th themselves. So, so wherever you were, you could, you could have your little Enchiridion with you. They would also uh, write them out in journals. So Seneca says, like, find a quiet space at the end of the day and write down in your journal you know, re to rehearse. What they were doing was training their self-talk. We all have this automatic monologue within us, which is usually unexamined and unconscious, and often in, for Westerners, extremely self-critical. So we are basically being mean to ourselves often uh, 24 hours a day. Um, so with maxims, you are consciously uh, washing, brainwashing yourself, but you're choosing what you're brainwashing yourself with. Marcus Aurelius said, um, the mind becomes dyed with the color of its habitual thoughts. Therefore, soak your mind in these ideas. Mm. So um, you train your, 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 your automatic self-talk. Um, they also very much emphasized eschesis, which is their word where we get asceticism from, for training. So Epictetus says, you may be very good at philosophy in the lecture room, but go out into the street and you're miserably shipwrecked. So, you know... <laughs> How well do you cope when, um, when someone's rude to you? How well do you cope when you get some misfortune at work? Uh, this is the kind of, the, you know, the field work it's called in CBT. So when I had social anxiety, um, one of the, the homework we were set was like, uh, go up and ask someone in the street uh, if they know the way to the North Pole. And it's ridiculous. And everything in your social anxiety is saying, don't, don't make do a fool it. of yourself. But this was called shame attacking. This is what Will Ferrell used to overcome his social anxiety. Consciously draw attention to yourself and ridicule on yourself to make yourself kind of immune to it. Um, so this was field work or homework. And then they have all kinds of, they didn't never really had breath training exercises. This is the Buddhists really and the Hindus were masters of that. But the um, Stoics would do things like train your attention onto the present moment. Uh, so, you know, Seneca says, what's the point of dra dragging up sufferings that are past? Why be miserable now because you were miserable then? So that was one technique they had, focus on the present moment. But they also had things like um, focus on, the, on deep history in order to remind yourself of how many people have lived and died in the past with all their dramas and all their crises and they're all, they're all in the dirt as a way to kind of like not be too worked up about your particular stuff. Yeah. So that's a practice that Marcus Aurelius does in his meditations. He kind of thinks of, he says to himself, and he was the emperor of Rome, think of all the empires that have risen and fallen. You know, where are they now? In other words, don't get too hung up 
or on the present. Um, another visualization exercise they use is to contemplate the stars and the, uh, the universe. Uh, or to, as you mentioned earlier, imagine your soul rising into space and seeing the earth from space. These were kind of zooming out exercises. So, you know, rather than being too caught up in the present thing, I don't know about you, like when I just look at pictures of space, I feel more or think about, you know, life on other planets. It chills me out because so they, they were, you could think of them as like master directors who have all these different lenses through which you can look at situations. And it's about being flexible in your lens. What is the best lens to view this event through? in order to kind of cope with it or integrate it or deal with it wisely. Yeah, those are brilliant. I, I love that. Um, I, I really, one of the things that really attracts me about Stoicism are these active meditations or thought experiments that you become almost the, uh, the object of your own experiment. And, you know, you're playing with the edges of your fear, for example. Like I have tremendous claustrophobia stemming from a traumatic event that happened to me as a child. I got locked in a locker mm -hmm. and I've been coping and managing that fear. I did this whole deep dive into the neurobiology of fear. It's actually what's actually happening in my brain when I'm feeling mm. um, scared and how you know, my amygdala can eclipse my prefrontal cortex in certain times because that trauma has remained kind of fixed or trapped inside my yeah. body as a samskara. And mm. so I'll go at certain times when I'm feeling that that welling up of panic, um, I'll go play, you know, with the edge of that fear where I'm in control still, but I'll, you know, put myself into a small confined space just to train myself in the adversity of that such that when I do have to actually confront it, yeah. I have a, a greater tolerance, yeah. you know, for doing so. I was reading a whole bunch of interesting, albeit somewhat morose, <laughs> um, techniques that I thought were interesting. So one is about happiness, for example. Um, so very often in modern day, happiness is equated with the aggregation of certain achievements or products or goods i'm going to get a new car and a new house or you know and then you you're happy for a moment but you know really then you're off craving the next thing and mm. this is a buddhist and uh in nature as well and you become trapped on this hedonic treadmill mm. and uh, you keep craving and grasping for that next thing but one of the tricks if you will, to happiness is actually wanting what you already have. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, there's great wisdom in that just in and of itself. But one of the ways that you can do that is to engage in a um, negative visualization where you can sit in the thought of not having something that you already have. Mm -hmm. And it brings you into a place of of gratitude and of non-craving um, that seems to assuage kind of this dissatisfaction that we often have um, with wanting more things. So I thought sort of negative visualization is yeah. an interesting idea. And like connected to that, I've heard of like, um, you know, the Stoics meditated a lot on their own mortality for example, mm. and um, not in a morbid way per se, but in um, in what has been framed as kind of a last time meditation um, where you pretend that you are engaging in an activity for the last time and how much more you would savor that, that moment um, or that activity. So here we are doing this podcast together. If this was my last podcast, if this is the last interview that I would ever do, you know, think of what, how precious that would be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is often equated um, with this metaphor of like, you know, 
um, of like leaving your house in the morning and giving for me, like my wife, a kiss, you know, goodbye, I'll see you later, uh, versus a soldier going off to Afghanistan or, well, not Afghanistan anymore, mm. but going off to war and giving his or her wife a kiss. Um, and what that notion of like, well, this might be the last time. Yeah. So meditating on these things that make the here and now more precious and sacrosanct. Yeah. And it, it reminds me as you speak of, of Buddhism as well. I mean, I've been reading this book by a, a British Buddhist teacher who you, you should have interviewed, but I'm not sure you did because he died last year during the pandemic and okay. he was only about 50, called Rob Burbea. Mm. Did you ever come across him? Just by name. But Didn't I, really yeah. travel. He wasn't on yeah. the circuit, but he wrote a great book called Seeing That Frees. And he talks about how in Buddhism, everything is a view, like everything, like your idea of Jeff is a view, like this table is a view. Our whole sense of reality all the way down is constituted by views. And we can develop a certain freedom and lightness by being aware of that and then learning to kind of play with views. First of all, being conscious of the views we're taking, but then also kind of playing with it. What's it like to try this view or that view? And that's like what you were talking about, isn't it? Yeah. It's like a kind of epistemic flexibility. <laughs> right. But it's not just relativism. It's just seeing that, you know, views that constitute everything. And so what would, you know, like just when you were talking about, imagine this was the last interview. Like, oh, wow. This <laughs> is yeah, like, right. you know, well, we make were, the most of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we were talking about this um, yesterday when we were talking on the phone. Um I'd have to find a good turn of phrase for this, but almost prospective nostalgia, if you will. Yeah. Where generally we look back on a time where it's like, oh, when my kids were young and we used to go play in the park and those were the good old days. Mm. Well, what if like these were the good old <laughs> if, days yeah. right here? As Jack Nicholson said, what if this is as good as it gets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. And having nostalgia for this moment right now. Yeah. Um, it almost as an anticipated memory. Yeah. Um, so we can, yeah. we can skillful, you know, skillful means they call it. We can learn to, to play with views. Right. Now, um, the defense pessimism one, that's also a technique which, for example, Tim Ferriss uses, right? If you're prone to anxiety about what if, what if, what if. So the defense of pessimism is thinking through the worst that could happen or the things that could go wrong and then accepting them in advance. The worst that can happen is you're going to die, but you are going to die. So if you can accept that, then you can then you can operate from a place of a bit more freedom and lightness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've I've heard of this also another kind of mindset technique that you are living a dream life. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And you're like, what do you mean? I, I don't feel like I'm living a dream life. I want all of these things that I haven't achieved yet. Well, you are living a dream life for someone else mm. because there is someone else that would give anything to be in the situation that you are in to have your basic needs met to be have time to think and move and exercise and eat different decent food and to be in conversation with interesting people yeah and like people you are living someone's dream life yeah and so there is a trance life meditation technique where you essentially put yourself in that person's shoes and witness your own life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I, I think Seneca says something like, you know, the angry person is acutely sensitive to all that they're owed and, uh, and blind to all that they've received. Mm. Um, so there are all kinds. I mean, like two other techniques I, I want to practice while we're talk, uh, talk about, while, while we're talking about it. One is they they have this idea which comes from Socrates that we Socrates said we sleepwalk through the day, so we are on autopilot. We're like a kind of marauding elephant crashing around. We don't necessarily know who we are and how we actually act, what our character is like. We may have an idea of our character, but our actual self is quite different. So um, they had techniques to try and keep track of who you are. So Seneca says. At the end of the day, say, what did I do today? What did I do well? And what did I do badly? The Jesuits use a similar technique. It's called, uh, they call it recollection. Just to try and live more consciously, to just think back over the day. Oh, I, you know, um, how well did you try to develop the virtuous habits you're trying to develop? How well did you weaken 
the vices that you're trying to weaken. And they would use certain techniques as well to keep track of themselves, like um, counting. Epictetus said, uh, if you have a bad temper, count the days on which you manage not to lose your temper. And if you get to 30 days, then consider that you're making progress. So these quite modern techniques for, for kind of habit building. Right. Because Stoicism was a was a, was a what's called a, um, a virtue ethics philosophy, and this is like there were virtue ethics traditions in Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Aristotle, and it's this idea that virtues are habits. Yeah. Um, the word for I think I, I believe the ancient Greek word for habit is ethos. It's ethos. Yeah, yeah. I believe it's customs or something. Yeah, like that. which is yeah. where we get the word ethics from. Yeah. So, right. You know, to paraphrase Aristotle, this is a famous misquote of him, but it's a good misquote. Yeah. <laughs> good, <laughs> but go it's like, it. we are what we repeatedly do. So character is not an act, but a habit. Mm. That was someone writing about Aristotle. You know, Heraclitus said, um, ethos is destiny. So, you know, if you want to know your future, don't go to an astrologer. Look at your daily habits or, 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 or think about your daily habits. Yeah, the best predictor of future events is past performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, well, Seneca was an epic writer. Mm. Um, and if you want to focus on specific techniques, I mean, journaling. Yeah. Particularly in the evening. I mean, I think Seneca did almost all of his writing in the evening when he could actually take moral inventory of his day. Right. And actually acknowledge the places where he lived in uh, alignment with his virtue or his highest principles and where he fell short yeah um, and use that that evening space before he went to bed um to write and to journal um yeah. that created a tremendous amount of, of clarity but also probably established a lot of new neural networks yeah. just by the sake of doing it over and over again. Yeah, I, I describe like the journal as like a mental dojo. We're here in quite a yeah. cool kind of yoga and meditation room. So it's a place where you can rehearse, mm -hmm. um, ex do self-examination of your habits and so on, but rehearse maxims, perspectives. And it's interesting, like probably one of the most popular books of Western philosophy uh, is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Um, the sales of which, by the way, in England went up like 500% during the pandemic, which is funny because it was written during a pandemic. Like, there, you know, Rome was being beset, was beset by a plague for, for many years. I, 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 it's possible, I think, Marcus even died in, in that plague eventually, but I'm not sure about that. But that was his journal. It was a, it, 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 he didn't write it for publication. That was what he carried with him on military campaigns and so forth. And that was where he just kind of um, had a conversation with himself and a dialogue with his with his better self. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you feel like we've progressed since those times? Mm, I think in some ways. They were fine with slavery, uh, for example. They were fine with profound patriarchy. Uh, they were fine with um, empire. So I think we've made some collective moral progress uh, through that. I don't think they treated animals very well. Um, they didn't harm the environment like we did, but that was partly because they were just a smaller. So I do believe in that idea of moral progress. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it's interesting that their ethical psychological advice is so pertinent today. Yeah. So in that sense, the raw matter of human nature seems to be very similar. And the kind of things that that um, really got to people then, you know, it was like, oh, I was I was sat in a crappy place at the dinner party. Yeah. Like, you know, well, yeah. don't be so worried about that. So it was the same petty things as as wind us up today. Um, so um, so that's interesting. We should, by the way, we should I should also mention, you know, that we've the Stoics were this religious spiritual philosophy. They also believed this was one of their kind of it wasn't just a visualization, a visualization exercise, what they really believed. They believed in this thing called the Logos, uh, and they, which is basically they believed that all of the universe was connected by a kind of divine intelligence, which is within all things, not just in humans. They were, they were pantheists. So uh, actually in, in rocks and, and, and you know, water, and as, but it resonates at a particularly higher kind of um, frequency in human consciousness. 
Um, and so they would meditate on this, how all things, you know, Marcus says to himself, you know, consider how all things are connected. They would meditate on the interconnection of all things. And because they, they were pantheists, they also believed, you know, they believed in providence. They believed that ultimately everything kind of happens for a reason and the universe has purpose and intelligence. And they would make, um, they would say prayers to the Logos, but they were interesting prayers. They're quite different to something like, you know, law of attraction, secret type things. They would say, um, lead me Zeus and thou, O, o, o Logos. So, you know, may I, may I fulfill thy will. So in the way, like a Christian prayer as well, like a good Christian prayer, let me be a vessel of thy will, Lord. Like not my will, not kind of bring me a, a new Chevy or something or a new Tesla. Mm. Um, but, you know, help me to accept and fulfill the will of the Logos. And it's similar to Taoism, right? Yeah. Like empty yourself out of, of, of egotism and pride so that you can fulfill the will of the Tao. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's an ex it seems to be an acceptance of fate or at least an embrace of fate. Yeah. Um, it's funny, I actually came across the famous serenity prayer, the Niebuhr quote, the... Uh, give me serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to, the, to change, change the, the things, things that I can, I can yeah. and the wisdom to delineate the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it felt very stoic. Yeah. I mean, when I do talks on stoicism, and if there's anyone there from AA, Never, yeah. they're like, wow, that's, you know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, yeah, it is. And, 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 and of course, in, in AA, there's the idea of surrendering to the higher power. Like I can't, well, yeah. well stoicism is, is a bit more like you can do it yourself with just with your reason. But there is the idea of the higher power. There is the idea of the logos. You know, there, there is this idea that the universe is kind of good and intelligent and on your side. So, um, but yeah, I think AA, there's all kinds of like, you know, like it's been three months, you know, counting the days since your last drink and that kind of thing. Yeah. And the process of uh of moral inventory yeah right step four yeah um yeah which yeah, is yeah. just a it's a very arduous journaling process basically yeah um which uh which i think it's fascinating and obviously borrows heavily from christian tradition but yeah but seems also to have a stoic component to it well yeah i mean christianity was as, as we were discussing before this um took a lot from stoicism uh, you know, Jesus is the Logos made flesh. Uh, the Gospel of St. John says, in the beginning was the Logos. Mm -hmm. So they, they it, it was, you know, Nietzsche said that Christianity is like Platonism for the masses. Yeah. But there's a, there's a yeah. lot of Greek philosophy um, in, uh, like Seneca was pretty much an unofficial saint in the Middle Ages. There are stained glass windows of like Seneca and Socrates um, St. Teresa of Avila called St. John of the Cross, my little Seneca. So these mystics all really knew they were, there was a culture, it's, it's different to Christianity now where like, you know, if you go to church and talk about like Greek philosophers, they'll kind of be a bit, you know, uh, wary, but, but, but in the kind of middle ages and in the Renaissance, these were Christian humanists. Right. They really knew their Greek and Roman philosophy. And, you know, like in Dante's Inferno, Sorry, Dante's Divine Comedy. The Greek philosophers are, 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 are just the, the level before heaven. They've got us, you know, they didn't have the Christian revelation, but they're still very right. high up. Well, I think that's an interesting thing. I mean, I think in and of its time, these were just letters and epistles written by man that ascribed some higher, some greater meaning to something bigger than themselves, at least mm. in, Christian, in Christianity. But... But we didn't get the sense of this divide between sort of revelatory um, religions and m more metho you know, methodic philosophies mm. until much later, right? Because mm -hmm. in and of their time, there seemed to be much more, I don't know, liquidity or amorphousness between and and an interplay between a lot of the philosophies and spiritualities that were all just bubbling in this cauldron right around the same time. It's yeah. just fascinating. Yeah. You know, like uh, Christian's favorite criticism of spiritual seekers is, oh, it's your pick and mix spirituality. Yeah, right. But, you know, look at the roots of Christianity. Yeah. I mean, they really picked and mixed. Uh, Augustine was deeply influenced by 
Plato and Neoplatonism and Stoicism and the idea of the, the Stoics have this idea of the cosmopolis, that we're all citizens of the city of the universe. Uh, and this very, and they, they developed basically the idea of the brotherhood of man and woman. And the Christians took that idea right. that we're all, you know, uh, you know, Augustine wrote a book about the kind of city of God. So there's, there's, there's lots of pick and mix in Christianity, which is great. Like there should be a, more of a dialogue, say, between, you know, atheists and Christians because they have this common ground of love of wisdom. This right. is it. This is in Christian culture. This is this is in atheist culture. This is in spiritual culture. Yeah, I, I think the difference is that in Stoic traditions and in other ones like Stoicism, there seems to be an innate suspicion of anything remotely fundamentalist or dogmatic <laughs> where in you know revelatory or abrahamic traditions mm. you know as tolerant as they might be at any given moment they are all still fundamental at their core it's you, either you accept jesus christ as your lord and savior in christianity or you don't and if you don't well then i'm sorry that you're likely doomed to some form of eternal blazes of your understanding <laughs> so um Whereas, you know, you know, Buddhism, you know, is more of a, at least in, in my interpretation of it, more of a methodical guide toward spirituality as self-awareness um, without any need to, for fealty to some sort of bearded yet invisible man on a mountaintop, you know, with a moral abacus, you know, registering your transgression. Yeah, yeah, and I mean Buddhism takes it to a particularly, you know, to a radical thing of no god, no self. Yeah, no self. Uh, yeah. But there's still a moral abacus. There's still karma. There's karma. You're right. <laughs> yeah, there's some sorrow. But I guess my point is, I'm just trying to look for the common ground, right? Fair enough. Which is the idea of wisdom, Sophia. Sophia is worshipped as as God in Christianity, and Sophia is worshipped as as God in Greek philosophy. Mm. So, you know, there's that common ground in, 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 in the worship of Sophia. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think as we kind of circle the wagons around what might be useful or have some utility to bring people together, you know, to mm. establish greater fraternité or brotherhood, uh -huh. um, you know, this idea of trying to find and locate consilience that can exist across a whole variety of traditions is, I think, very fruitful because this is this is what we need. We need to find these areas around which we can uh, agree. I mean, I look at like the golden rule, for example, or yeah, or or if you look at all traditions, for example, and you can identify certain common threads that sit behind, shared common threads that sit behind them all, right? Yeah. I like the golden rule. Or, you know, we didn't need Moses to hold up a stone tablet on, mount, on a mount that said, thou shalt not kill, to know that that, that, that is a moral imperative. So in some ways, I feel like there's this process of trying to find a shared moral intuition that can help guide us across all of these divisions. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, I love uh, the Renaissance because of its like humanism. Mm. Uh, and I, I, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, it's from the Latin playwright Terence. I am human. Nothing human is alien to me. Um, so, and it, it, you know, humanism is like develop wisdom. Wisdom will make you free. But it's also this idea that you can find wisdom in, in many cultures. There's Christian humanism. There was a whole Islamic humanist movement. There is a secular humanist movement. So, you know, and and you know, when I, when I wrote my first book about Greek philosophy, it was particularly popular with atheists. And my second book was about ecstatic mystical experiences. The and I became a Christian during it briefly. And the, the atheists were appalled. But to me, these are, this is a common quest. This is the, you know, the love of wisdom. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that in, you know, I, I, I love, uh, like things like interfaith initiatives 
which includes like, you know, dialogues and friendships with atheists and, and people of different, you know, political backgrounds as well. That kind of interfaith dialogue, I think, is at the heart of humanisms. And it's not just like, because people think of humanism as atheism. It's not. It's like, it's love of wisdom. That's how I think of humanism. Yeah, or the idea that humans fill the cosmos with meaning and purpose, and the cosmos doesn't fill humanity with meaning and purpose. Well, that's like kind of 20th century humanism. But but huma, you could be a humanist. And I mean, I interviewed a guy called Jeff Kripal, who, who's the director of research at Esalen. He talks about the mystical humanities. So you can believe in God and be a humanist. But it's also about balancing the mystical and the revelatory with the rational and the pragmatic. So a humanist would still believe in kind of rational dialogue, but they might also like, like Erasmus be prone to the occasional mystical experience. Yeah. Do you think that Abrahamic religion has any utility in the modern era? Um, I think it, it can be put to amazing uses. Uh, first of all, it exists. So what are you going to do? Say, oh, if we could just do it without the, the Muslims or just do it. Like, when you listen to Sam Harris, it sounds like, oh, if we could only get rid of the pesky Muslims. You know, they exist. What are you going to do? Um, within those traditions, there, is, um, there, are, there are all kinds of different views you could take of it. There are all different ways you could sing that, that uh, hymn sheet. Uh, there are traditions in Christianity, like I come from a Quaker family. Which, you know, spirituality kind of came from the Quakers, right? They, they were like, everyone has an inner light of God within us. And you can find wisdom in different religions and different traditions. Um, so, you know, what, what are the traditions you want to emphasize uh, in, in Christianity or in Islam or in Judaism? Likewise, in Buddhism, you know, you could find very militant nationalistic forms of Buddhism. Yeah. Or you can find much more... Peaceful. I mean, it exists today in Myanmar. Yeah. So yeah. What, what aspects of these traditions do you want to kind of platform and emphasize? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously for a very long time, every sculpture, piece of architectural brilliance, um, symphony <laughs> um, was birthed from the church. And, uh, and obviously, you know, the community that was fostered around um, the church had great impact. And there are certainly heuristics within gospel that are informative around the notion of, of values. I just wonder now, in this day and age, when we're confronting Kind of existential crises such as climate change or mm. the potential re-emergence of fascism or totalitarianism etc if we really want to be spending as much time as we do debating gay rights contraception stem cell use abortion is that really in the 21st century where we want right. to be spending our time. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I mean, I, you know, I only came here a week ago. <laughs> so I'm from, you know, in the UK, like, it's so different. Like, it's so secular. Um, the church is, 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 is kind of completely toothless. It has no influence on our culture. Um, uh, and spirituality is also very weak. This is extremely secular, um, this, you know, this world society, extremely humanist. Uh, if you mention spirituality, you're considered odd. Uh, it's never covered in the mainstream media. For, it, over there, I see Christians and I see like, hey, you guys believe in God too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. we're yeah. in the freaky minority. Right. Um, right. So it's, it's, you know what I mean? But I bet you if I, if I, you know, if I lived here for a while, I'd be like, oh, those Christians, you know, like with your fundamentalists. So it's, it's, it's about perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I just, the ethics has been values, let's say, has been the providence of, of religion and, and facts have been the, the providence of, uh, of science. That's 
kind of the post enlightenment way of, uh-huh. sort of looking at some of these things. And I just wonder if there is not an ethical or a values based science that we can't get our shoulders into. Uh, um, you mean, or do you mean a science based ethics? Yes. Yeah. A science based ethics, essentially something that can be studied empirically that does not. Uh, lean into fundamentalism or dogmatism, but that is also not morally relative. Yeah. And finding something that seems perennial, that feels universal, that has real metric, that has empirical value, such that humanity can invest in some sort of values-based universe that doesn't have to be well, you know, I'm going to heaven or hell or there's a book of revelations or something. I, I'm i on board with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm from the, you know, the same, in that sense, I'm from the same kind of spiritual culture as you. And I know that people have been trying to build a kind of empirical spirituality uh, since the 19th century. Um, and it's been, and we've made progress in that. There, you know, we've made progress in the kind of psychology of meditation or the psychology of psychedelics and you know there's now lots of funding and research into these kinds of uh, fields um but i i don't think it's ever going to be in, entirely kind of um scientifically proven nor would we want it to be probably not because because um first of all because it, it's very hard to measure what makes someone good you have to define good in a certain way, right? It's also hard to measure, scientifically measure, to what extent, how humble someone is. Like, it's just hard to measure. Um, so um, it's but, also... But can and, you and, measure and, human suffering? So, I mean, yes, you can, but rather bluntly. You can sure. say, how, how bad do you feel on a scale from one to ten? Uh, you know, we can't measure suffering in, in, in animals, for example, yet, um, or, in, or, in, or in babies. But... Um, the other issue is that I think all of our moral views depend to some extent on certain un, un, unmeasurable things. Like, you know, certainly if you believe in kind of God or the soul, um, these can't be exactly pinned down and measured, um, love or justice. So we don't live in a totally quantifiable universe. And that's actually okay because the risks of totally, you know, science-based ethics is they, you know, you get people saying, we know scientifically what leads to flourishing. We are the experts in it. So you just do exactly what we tell you. So it can lead to a kind of scientistic tyranny. When I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Sam Harris, but he believes you can have a completely, you know, you can do, create moral facts. I know scientifically exactly what leads to flourishing. And you can hear in Sam's work sometimes, this leads to actually a fundamentalism, no? Yeah, well, this is... Yeah, this is why it's so difficult to parse, really, yeah. where you could probably cohere much of humanity around the notion that feels very utilitarian, that we that society should be acting in a manner such that we are maximizing uh, well-being for the most possible people while minimizing suffering for the most possible people. Mm. Now, that, that is a broad tenet. Um, and there will always be people that will be fall more on the humanitarian side of that and be like, well, you know, it, it is not, it, it is not justifiable for the individual to suffer at the hands of the majority or whatever. But if we could agree as a, as a global society that we should be acting within that framework, then from there, one could extrapolate certain kinds of metrics that I think could inform a society of well-being or a a society that values well-being more. So that might be child poverty or literacy or underlying health, um, access to health care. And I I know that many, like New Zealand and there's some other... Kind of, I mean, obviously, most famously Bhutan, but I think some of the Nordic uh, Scandinavian countries have instituted um, metrics of well-being instead right. of like just like GDP. 
sure. or whatever. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of what I'm I'm poking at here because it, it seems like we, um, okay that 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 science has been incredibly useful and it has provided us with all sorts of technology and innovation. But in the absence of values, science so often gets corrupted in for the purposes of capitalism or profit, such that, you know, the medical science gets leveraged for the pharmaceutical industry or, you know, um, uh, horticultural advances always gets kind of shoveled into big food or big agriculture, a lot of these. And if we were operating um, through a lens that our technology, our rationality, our reason was always being leveraged through the lens of a values-based structure, that we may be able to address some of these greater issues of injustice and yeah. fairness. I think you're right. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges of the 20th century, and it's still the challenge today, is that science becomes the dominant force in our culture, um, not religion so much. Um, and, uh, and yet, as you say, it, it leads to sometimes awful situations like, um, you know, some of the Nazi medical experiments. I mean, as a result, after World War II, there was a move to kind of uh, towards things like bioethics mm -hmm. and medical ethics who gets the um you know the, the 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 kidney transplant if you know like there needs to be a medical board to decide otherwise it always goes to the white guy or <laughs> you know or like right. so um and there are you know there are people here in LA investing in you know AI ethics yeah uh if if there's an automated car and you could either hit a granny or <laughs> or a kid like who should it hit right right um so People are people. I think we are, and you know, um, my, you know, I, I, I would just say that you know, it, I'm wary of the search for some perfect neat solution. I think it's 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 always messy. You know, the the the, the rapture never comes, so it's it's the messy process of of, of you know, social conversation. What we as a society think is acceptable or unacceptable. Uh, we're in that conversation now about social media. What what do we think is acceptable or unacceptable? And it moves so slowly and it's so messy. But that is how things change. That's how moral progress happens. Gradually, messily, we think it's, it's actually not okay to have slaves. It's not okay to just mistreat animals. It, it's not okay to beat people up because of their sexuality. So it's, yeah. it's that kind of messy uh, yeah. collective yeah. conversation. But that's kind of... And, and, and maybe philosophy can help us in terms of like, don't get too emotional, don't argue ad hominem, try to argue the person's point rather than their personality. But, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, but we, we, I don't want to, one thing that I, I would want to avoid is classifying philosophy as something that exists something somewhere off in a in a cave or in a university i think there's of course one of the main points of the stoics right was yeah. that philosophy is meant to be applied yeah. it's not just contemplative yeah and uh, i i think that this discussion is honestly central to some of the most prescient is issues that we're dealing with yeah. i mean to be honest like i don't think it's okay for social media to uh to algorithmicize human negativity bias such that people are constantly addicted to outrage and anger. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I think that is a societal ill. Yeah, and particularly when it, it appears that they, they know it from their own internal metrics that this is damaging people's mental health and they're choosing apparently profits over yeah. the good of society. Right. Yeah. Cool. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this interview from the Commune podcast, then I think you'll love this video right here. This is something we need to understand that our faculties as sense perception is only good for survival, not for exploring the nature of the existence.